kind of like, I don't feel great. I like to call it, it the O'Charlies feeling. It, it <laughs> 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 no slight on O'Charlies. <laughs> he he uh, sometimes calls me one of his mentors, but uh, I have some right here. But, uh, you know, we've, we've, we've been acquainted. And, I'm um, right there with you. I got nauseous afterwards. <laughs> we'll be back tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> and Just he was giving out discounted the pizzas. To the, the, worst, the worst you could That's say about cool. me, the better. And, and Yelp is just like, cricket, <laughs> cricket. And That's what do funny. we do? Yeah. Uh, yeah. How, how are dads going to ask the name of the server, right? Yeah. If, they, if they don't so, have, yeah, if I, they're talking to an I, iPad. That, that, that's pretty low stakes. It works. It seems to work with a cookie. I don't see it working with the whole meal. Well, it doesn't because then you're a nonprofit. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome to the Think Fresh Move Forward podcast. And today's guest is Dan Brantingham, restaurateur and owner of a number of restaurants. Uh, I like so literally how we just had a conversation. I know, Don't call about, someone a restaurant. We just, we just, yeah, so, so uh, yeah, that was what was in my mind at the yeah. time, right? So uh, one of which, uh, okay, so this is a common question that comes up, right? Right. Uh, is it burger batch or burger bock? I, I usually like to at least put a dollar wager on that, but it is Burger Batch. Burger Batch. Yeah. I told these Burger guys. Batch. They didn't yeah. believe me earlier. I said, so I was fine I with swear that one. the it's hostess said that to me at yeah. some point. And I was like, it's not it. complicated either. That's, that's what the Kiwis or the New Zealanders call their vacation home, their getaway. It's a batch. Yeah. Oh. And, it, and it's really just short for a bachelor pad, but it's very common in New Zealand. Ah. Oh, okay. okay. That's cool. Okay. That's cool. Where's your batch, mate? Where are we, you going? We, me and James out there last week. Yeah. The shore pump yeah. location. Very good. Oh, nice. Yeah. Good. The, uh, um, I get the French chick, typically. Nice. Very Auckland good. chick. Yeah. Yeah. Killer. Good. So where did, you, where did you get the idea for, uh, like, what was the concept for, for Burger Batch? As I stated a little bit, uh, Michael Rip started the batch. Uh, Michael is the oldest of four boys from the Rip family who are known uh, very well in Richmond for having the Arby's here. Family owns and operates about 20 Arby's, but uh, Michael That's a was lot the of oldest. Arby's. Yeah, a lot of Arby's. Blob beef. <laughs> oldest of four, growing up in the business, uh, he'd gone to New Zealand uh, to visit his son, and over there he, he kind of got into the whole grass-fed beef. Okay, so that's cool. that's the uh, so I've actually I'm actually the only one here that's never been. So what can I? Uh, so what's what's different about Burger Batch from other burger spots? Yeah, good question. Uh, first and foremost, there's no freezers; everything's fresh. Really? Hey, hey, how do you do that? Uh, all the beef and lamb come in from New Zealand. It comes in fresh. We grind seven days a week, so we're in there grinding uh, ribeye, brisket, and chuck every day. So constant shipments coming from New Zealand. Yep. Oh wow. Yeah, and it, and it comes chilled. You say, how does that work? It comes chilled, so it's 34 degrees, and there's a big movement toward the chilled import-export business. H help me understand, what so what happens with that? So 32 degrees is freezing, so like, what is the difference between like 5 degrees? Like, uh, what does not it functionally frozen. do? It's not frozen. So it doesn't it doesn't freeze all the way and John might John's a scientist. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> how how is how is meat being affected by by uh, five degrees less? Like I mean I know it's fr it's it's freezing. So like what does freezing do to meat? I guess is a, is a question. Yeah. So I'll take a second first and just remind everybody Integra Procurement Services John Sukor. Oh yeah. Hey, we have uh, John with us. John's been with us before. Over here too. Hey, by by <laughs> the way, um, no, but imagine um, uh, when you uh, scoop up a handful of snow, large ice crystals, very crystally. Uh, ice is sharp. So when something freezes very slow, uh, it, it'll shatter cell structure. That's why when you freeze and thaw vegetables from the garden, when you go back and let them thaw, there's a bunch of water in there. Well, that didn't come from the atmosphere. It's all that shattered cell structure from the vegetables. Well, same can happen with meat. And that's why oftentimes, like, your frozen burgers won't bind as nicely together and hold together as well as a fresh burger because uh, a lot of that protein has been broken out of the cell structure of the meat. So non-frozen binds better, holds together better, has a nicer bite and chew. His, his burgers are steak-like yeah. versus being crumbly on the palate. Wow. Huh. So, really? so grinding your beef at home is better for a burger than just buying especially oh if it's never been frozen 100%. beef yes uh, absolutely huh. so now it's it's difficult to find you can't just go anywhere and find uh never frozen beef because like all all beef at the grocery store has been frozen not necessarily no okay not so where, where where can somebody find 
I mean, listen, not Walmart. Your, your better your <laughs> better stores would have um, they bring in now what they call bag meat. We're not getting high uh, halves and quarters of cows like back when we were kids, right, Dan? Uh, you would see those hanging in the butcher shop back behind the the glass, but they're getting bag meat, which are quarters already broken down, and they're still carving out. There's still some talented butchers inside of these grocery store butcher shops, and they're still cutting down. So usually when you're getting grocery store beef that's in a package that was packaged in the grocery store. Yeah, that's the key. Right? It likely had never been frozen. Mm. It still has not been frozen. When you go home and throw it in the freezer, you've done what you did. Yeah. 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 And, and so I guess there's I guess you're talking about something that's slowly frozen. I guess there's a difference between flash fr flash freezing and. Well, with Dan's saying, it's, it's held at a, a close to frozen temperature, so that temperature never penetrates all the way through and freezes the meat solid. It's just keeping the atmosphere around it very cold so that it's holding bacterial breakdown. It's, it, it's a sense of suspension. It's just yeah. holding it still as long as it takes to get here. I've seen... Very cool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. unfro so I've been... When I was in Nepal back in 2017, I did the Himalayas uh, Everest Bay Camp Trek. You can't slaughter animals on the mountain. It's a it's a it's a, it's a Buddhist thing. Mm -hmm. So the only way to get meat up is it has to be brought up by a porter. When you see a porter with a sack of meat on his back and it's not frozen, you're just like I'm I'm going vegetarian for the next uh, two three weeks. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> it's, uh, so what do you find uh, is 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 successful about that? So you're you're also talking about grass fed though. So you're not just never frozen. But you're also grass fed. So like what are the what are the taste differences that you find in your meat versus just has a different flavor. Uh, you know, Americans are used to corn-fed beef. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a little bit sweeter, I think, in, in taste. But the grass-fed has just a real nice leanness to it. Mm. The most interesting thing is a lot of people will comment after they eat at Burger Batch or eat grass-fed beef and say, you know, I don't feel bad or I don't feel tired or I don't feel this or mm. how I normally do. And the reason is the grass-fed is very, very nutritious. That's, that's really interesting. I mean, it's better the for the cows too, right? I mean, you got <laughs> you've got cattle that you know it's it's black Angus and and it is raised 100% of its life in in nature. It's not confined. It's got natural grass, clean air, clean water, and number one in the world for husbandry, animal husbandry, and animal welfare is New Zealand. Wow! And according to the well, US, that's really cool. Yeah. Let me break the seal on something else yeah. too, because Dan said something really remarkable about how you feel. I've been working on restaurant concepts for many years now, and something about leaving a restaurant and having been satiated, you've had enough to eat, but not feeling that stuffed feeling or that lethargic feeling or kind of like, I don't feel great. I like to call it, it the O'Charlie's feeling. It, it <laughs> 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 no slide on O'Charlie's. <laughs> but, but point being, when you go to Dan's place and a lot of the places that I worked on in my career when I had agency, we were building concepts on fresh ingredients. So you're not gonna go to Dan's and get a bunch of bottled sauces. That's the other thing that's significant about Dan's concept. Oh, yeah, your sauces are great. I love that aioli, the garlic his aioli. All scratch. His yeah. concepts are really all scratch sauces. So you're not Make our own opening mayo. a bottle of something that had been processed and loaded with preservatives. Fresh produce getting blended up into a chimichurri, you're gonna feel very differently oh, than wow. when you have high sodium and high preservatives coming in your body for a meal. That's not what you get at Dan's you concepts, his multiple concepts. He's no, got more than one. On, yeah, yeah, nothing on that menu that, that we buy. Uh, we make it all. Oh, wow. Yeah. You have this Manuka sauces and honey mustard <laughs> that you're adding? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> the garlic aioli, though, that's number one. Oh, it's surprise. fantastic. I'm sure. Fantastic. Yeah. Yep. You know, I went to a, uh, so I went to a restaurant one time in New York. This is a tangent I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> I went to a restaurant one time in New York, and they had, uh, they only sold fries. It mm. was about the size of a closet, mm. and, and they had like they had probably way over what was safe to be in there. There's probably 50 people in there, mm. and like it was like this, it, like the restaurant was as wide as like the smallest bedroom in a house, <laughs> and it was just like so you would just walk down and you had to like go sideways to get to the counter because of the wall. Mm. Super not safe. Uh, but <laughs> anyway, you go down there and then they all they have is fries. So it's fries. You pick your fries, you pick your seasoning, you pick your uh, sauce. Okay. And it, it was like they give you this cone of fries and then like they they like drizzled the sauce on it. And uh, But I'm telling you what, there was a reason people – it was like 3 in the morning and there was like people just lined out the door still. Sure. I mean there's some Obviously for that drinking too. too but, uh, <laughs> but that's another that's another calling card of the brand mm. is if you, you know, win a lot of awards for best burger, best 
fries, but if you start with the best potatoes, so we use russet Burbank potatoes, you know, they're available, cooked only in peanut oil, and that's the only product going into like the fryer. So you're using refined peanut oil, you're only putting in raw potatoes, so they're blanched, and then they're finished when they're ordered. But uh, you take that potato and you cook it in peanut oil, and there's nothing else in there contaminating your, your shortening of your oil. There's nothing breaded, there's no onion rings, there's no coated on the fries or chicken sandwiches or cheese sticks. That's super wow. interesting. It's just a potato. In yeah. It's GF. So it's yeah. like, pu- so it's yeah. like, it's kind of a, kind of a, a methodology of just purity. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, we were, we did a video for a farm uh, out, where was it? Georgia. 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 No, 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 not, not the, not oh, the Atlanta mean, farm. Oh, you mean Grisette? No, no, not that farm. There was that. I <laughs> not that one. How okay. many farms have we filmed? Okay, <laughs> we filmed three farms, I as guess. As far as I know, there's two, there's three. Loxley? Loxley, yes. Oh, yeah. Loxley. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes. yeah, so there's a, uh, um, that farm. Yeah, th- there was a farm we went to, and they, they make their cheese there, and they raise their cows there. So yeah. they, like, they do everything. Yeah. And it was, it's it was a totally different, uh, yeah, like experience because like their cows got to basically just like hang out in that's the field it. all day. Yeah, yeah. And, and then th- they would just bring the them in, right? And what you're describing with the the grass fed element mm. of this, they even notice different flavor profiles depending on the season sure. based on the grass that they're eating, right? Which is really interesting. Yeah. There's also there's also a calmness to the animals and the beef that mm. are raised in in nature and uh, you know on the pasture. So it actually has something to do with the pH level, mm-hmm. you know, you of know the what? beef. So <laughs> it's a lot. There, there's a lot more anxiety and higher pHs and and, and toughness. Wow. Yeah. Uh, so it, it's yeah. I, I I think I've I just recently uh, read what you're talking about. There's a it's not cortisol. Cortisol is in humans, but it's something like cortisol. Yeah. So whenever whenever you're scared and afraid, it's like released. cortisol pumps through our it's, system. It's released and it goes into your muscles. And yeah. It's going into the and milk. But, it's but going in the, the the food. Obviously, cows have a similar similar hormone that does the food. exact same thing. So Bodily chemistry. Yeah. So yeah. yeah. Obviously, having organic food matters, and people care about at least most people care about that. Now, that's not the – I'm assuming that's not the one thing that makes Burger Batch successful. And then you also have other chains that you've started. Yeah, what else, yeah. What else um, have you started? You own, what, the Cocky Rooster? Yeah. Which I don't know how – John brought us onto it, but the chicken you have there is just massive. <laughs> and it's delicious. <laughs> the tenders are, are big. So is know? the chicken um, – I'm assuming – We use – you know, there's three different sizes of wings, and we, we use a jumbo wing, a fresh wing. To me, a lot of what makes the rooster stand out are the sauces. Mm, once again. Uh, we are indeed about 80 sauces and came up with 14. And w- we didn't have John on that project. I, w- I wish I would have. But anyway, a lot of culinary guys, and, and uh, we have some partners in it. Uh, Luke and Will Phillips are partners. My son-in-law, Brent Deal, is a partner, Michael Yates. So uh, a lot of really smart guys, but we, we collated a lot of recipes and, and got those straight. We went and and tested the fryers, we tested the shortenings, we tested the oils, all in, in his uh, in his lab. But, um, you know, we came up with the products we wanted, and then the name, people liked the name. And uh, But it, it, then we did the, the fresh breaded tenders and the sandwiches. So it's a combination of sandwiches, tenders, yeah. and wings, smoked wings, fried wi- wings, rubs, and sauce. So from how do you take a concept to reality for a new restaurant in layman's terms? Yeah, no, uh, that's a good idea, uh, a good question. Um, to start, I mean, what is the concept? Uh, who's the consumer? Where would it play? Uh, you have to have a good location. You, you can't have a good location if you don't know. Location's who everything? What'd you say? It's yeah. huge. Yeah. It is. And How, you, but you got to know who your consumer is, too. Do you, when you're finding a location, do you do this on yourself, or do you have, like, a commercial real estate agent help you? Both. Okay. And do what makes you decide the right location is it a certain numbers the population everybody has access to a lot of demographics um so you've got access to things like household incomes you know what are the ages what are the education what are people driving what are they watching on tv where do they go shop where do they work out i mean there's there's data uh, overloaded data so it's it's a combination of looking at those demographics it's a combination of you can tell a lot too by who's already there. Mm. Uh, you know, is Chipotle there? Is Starbucks there? Mm. Is Chick Fil A there? Yep. Is you know whether it's technology or something else? But 
are th- are there drivers in that market that you know a small guy like us we don't have a big marketing budget well if you're sitting next to apple or chick-fil-a or starbucks you don't need one yeah uh, they've done it for interesting. you interesting yeah. yeah and it, it is interesting that you start there with the audience because that's the same kind of conversation we're going to have with any client sure. when it comes to marketing well, or content creation we got to get to the good stuff because we're not there yet yeah um location matters you know the concept what is it you know start with why you know simon Sinek. i mean wh- why do you need another burger why do you need another taco why do you need another chicken wing or pizza um so i think you have to have you know a purpose but where are you going to go who's your consumer and then how do you capitalize and I, I think a lot of people in our industry don't really have that piece of the puzzle with how do you start up the capitalization of it? Are you borrowing the money? Do you have investors? Yeah. How do you return that? Is it equity? Is it debt? What is it? That's the most that overwhelming question to well, me. Well, that's in any industry across it the board. Sh- it should be. Yeah. That's One of them. Yeah, that's <laughs> any industry across the board is, um, is people have this, um, they think that money is finite. So they have this lack of resources but in reality it's a lack of resourcefulness that people tend to have and finding the money's there the other the other big 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 bogey is if you're negotiating a lease use somebody that's experienced how to negotiate oh, a yeah. lease. you you can have the greatest concept on earth if you go to a bad location you're going to struggle if you have a, a good location and you have a great product or a great concept and you have a lousy lease agreement you're you're out of business before you open. You just mm. don't know it. You signed the death Oof. warrant. Yeah. It's wow. like it's like Oof. bleeding from a cut you can't see. And I, you know, even today, uh, you know, Richmond's a tremendous, tremendous food town. But uh, there's a lot of really well-known concepts and chefs who probably wish they could start that lease agreement over again. Yeah. Interesting. Wow. Let yeah. me let me ask you this. Uh, I'll move the mic real quick. Close it here. We've all seen like the restaurant location that changes the restaurant like every every three years, <laughs> right? So like what what what's going on there? Because a lot of times those are in like actually good locations, or it seems like good good like locations. Like Town is like you would think. I see restaurants all the time. Um, what's that one that just Citizen Burger just closed down? They did. And before that it was a pizza place, and then yep. before that I think it was another burger place. Yeah, but like there's it seems like those there's places there's restaurants that move into locations and it's like it becomes a revolving door of restaurants what's I, what's I, going on there in your opinion I, I think i think we're touching on it right now is what's the concept who's the consumer or you know you're talking about Kerry town specifically what kind of lease agreement did they have what kind of volume do they have you know what is their target margin or profitability I do they have you. a good buying group yeah oh there yeah you go. so yeah did they, they use integra <laughs> and obviously they, know, they didn't they because john yeah <laughs> but uh <laughs> <laughs> but but generally, you know, if you're starting a concept and you go into a lease agreement, generally you're looking at a 10-year term. Uh, so you've got 10 years. A lot of people <coughs> years ago, and John, you can jump in on this, you know, if you had a 10-year lifespan of a brand, you know, pick one, uh, that was good. Mm. But, you know, the legacy brands usually continue to go on longer. We know who, who they all are. But uh, all those ingredients matter is, and you know, now people can refresh it, but the turnover is what you want to avoid. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that- Turnover of of employees? Turnover the concept. Oh, the Turnover the business. And uh, you know, sadly again, people didn't really start at the beginning with, what am I doing? Who's my consumer? Where am I going? Do I know how to negotiate the lease? How did I structure the capital to do this? you know, do I have the capital and the margin to take care of the debt and pay my staff and maybe even have a return, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I don't care if you're pizza in a cup or you're moving a bun six feet or what you're doing, you better know those answers. Yeah, uh, rest, uh, to be a restaurateur, to be in the restaurant industry is to be a uh, uh, track and field analogy. It's a, it's a long distance race. There's no sprinting, you know, it's, you sprint a little bit to get open, but it's a long game. It's a marathon. And, and there's a lot of people that when I had the agency for 13 years would come and knock and you could tell the look in their eye, their behavior, their stance. They're like, you know, quick few million dollars for the next three years and we're out. And I'm just like, I would spend the first hour trying to talk them out of the business. It's not going to yeah, do it for you. Get in. It is mm-hmm. not that business. It's what? a long game for sure. Once you have the concept, so you got, <clears throat> you got location, you got money, concept, food, all that stuff, or at least recipes in mind. What do you usually do first thing to market a new location? Mm-hmm. Let's say 
you didn't have a huge advertising budget. What do you do in that instance to get the name Before out? Before you jump, Dan, can I, I'm going to cite, I did this last time, but I'm going to cite somebody who we both respect a lot in this market is look at Taza, Taza Kitchens because I worked on that with them and we began to market that via social media during the R&D phase. We were, in the middle right, of, yeah. we were in the middle of build out. Mm. It was gonna be six more months before it was done. Well, we started to bring people in tasting as we, develop, bingo, as we were developing salad sandwiches and so forth. We had just people that we knew coming in and hey, we're doing a cutting, come and taste today, give us your feedback. Well, they went crazy on social media. We didn't even ask them to go there today on a Monday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday night, it's uh, too deep at the bar and you're waiting for a table. Yeah, wow. It says a lot. Yep. It's preemptive and it's, it's start, don't wait till it's perfect. Be happy with progress. And then I, I tell you what, you could say that for almost anything in life. Yeah. Uh, uh, don't wait till it, don't wait till it's perfect. In, in any business, like don't wait till it's perfect. Like be content with progress. Like Gosh, that's and such great journey. advice. Here, here's an, an, another question for you, and this is, I would say, the next segment is cost of materials, and this is more so coming from John's part, and obviously uh, your expertise. But there's a lot of business owners, and there's uh, restaurants I've seen where they're buying from 10, 12 different places, and they're not really tracking costs being spent. There's uh, the money may be coming in, but there's a leak in their boat, and they're just constantly just dreading money. Yeah, because we've I'm all wincing. seen those shows like Restaurant Impossible or other shows, right, that are like dissecting the food costs, right? Yeah. Or the, you know, do you know what your costs are? Do you know what your margins are, right? Well, you better yeah. if you're in the industry. But yeah. it, it, it used to be years and years ago, the cost of goods sold, we would say COGS, was your number one cost of doing business and labor was your second primary cost, and we would call those your prime cost. So the combination of cost of goods sold plus labor equals prime. And y you'd have targets to, to run prime. What's happened as of late is prime has inverted. So instead of cost of goods being your biggest expense, it's now labor. So labor has overtaken what you're selling, your inventories, what you're serving and putting together. Uh, but coming back specifically to the cost of goods, once again, there's a lot of, you know, smaller restaurants and, and maybe more startups who think if they just find the right distributor or I'm going to squeeze or leverage my distributor. Um, I'll, I'll tell you a good, a, a good quick, um, funny story about the di distributor. So uh, during the last few years, we've had some, some uh, tougher times, but uh, one of the big boys at at uh, one of the local distributorships went to see some guys up in Charlottesville and <coughs> smart guys, darn guys, two of them partners, and they had multiple concepts and, and they said to the, to the gentleman, uh, you know, we think we're gonna be able to do this and we'll do that, we got four locations, da 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 da, and, and uh, the distributor rep uh, said, uh, was a truck here? I said, yeah. Uh, was there chicken on it? They said, yeah. And he paused and he said, that's where we're at. <laughs> that's where it's at. So yeah. you're getting the truck, you're getting the product. But coming back to it, you're not going to, you're not going to win the, the cost of goods side through distribution. Mm -hmm. You can win it if you go direct to supplier. Mm -hmm. And this, again, where, is where John and, and Integra comes in. Mm -hmm. You've got to know who's making the cup, the lid, the straw, who am I buying the beef from and the lamb? You know, where am I getting my, my commodity products? Uh, you better have intimate relationships with supply chain. And, and the more relationships you have through supply chain, the better chance you have to have a very stable cost of goods. Mm. And uh, the stability of that cost of goods is gonna make or break whether or not you're a, a, a for-profit business. Hmm. Wow. So tell me a little bit about some of the kind of more innovative things you feel you, like you've accomplished through the different concepts, right? Like, for example, I, I'd never thought of this before, but ordering Cocky Rooster, getting to order all flats was awesome, yeah. right? That's like a simple <laughs> thing that, yeah. and, and then I'm thinking to myself, well, wait a minute, like if everybody is ordering all flats, like what do you do with all the drums? And then I started realizing other people want only all drums. Yeah, right? I, want, so I want only drums. We're all not so like you, James. Well, I, the flats are where it's at, right? So, uh, <laughs> you know, but, uh, but I guess other people have different perspectives, right? So, 
So that's kind of an interesting concept. And I guess I don't know if other people done that before. That's not new or innovative, but uh, know, I found it to be. You know, when you talk about innovative in, in food service, the first thing you got to look at is technology. Mm. You know, what's the technology today? What's your POS, your point of sale, or it used to be called a cash register, but <laughs> what's yeah. your POS system, right? Uh, how are you marketing, which is all done online, and, and even websites for a while kind of went obsolete, mm -hmm. uh, and it came through search engine optimization and, and different ways to get out there and, and know where the consumer tracking was, et cetera, et cetera. As far as innovation goes, I don't, I don't think the industry inside the four walls really has that much. I, again, you move a burger six feet, you move a taco six feet, you move a wing six feet. You want to do it well. In our case, we'd like to do, say, think we can do it better than anyone or, you know, who we're competing against. But it's block and tackle. It's, it's greeting the, the, the guest. Uh, it's how you talk to them. It's how you, you offer and deliver hospitality and service. You know, how do you make a difference in you guys going out or going out with your wives or your friends or your family? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I don't think of innovation so much inside. <coughs> doesn't mean it doesn't exist, but you'd probably be looking more at equipment. You know, we've been using flat top griddles for a long time, uh, for example, and brands won't be said, but a, a normal four foot flat top griddle you can get for three or four thousand dollars. An innovative flat top griddle that John has is fifteen thousand. Mm. So yeah. a lot of difference in recovery and heat, things like that. So I think there's some some good innovation on the product side or the equipment side, mm -hmm. but in terms of just execution, it's still block and tackle. And how how uh, how much R and D do you feel like has gone into these different concepts? Right, you mentioned what 80, 80 flavors yeah. to get a dozen or sixteen, fourteen, or yeah, fourteen, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, which kicking cowboy is very good. That's good, that's good one call. of my favorites. It's number mm -hmm. number four. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> so so you took eighty to get yeah. there, right? Yeah. And yeah. was that at the beginning of the concept? Oh yeah. Okay. Before we opened, uh, same thing. You know, looking at at uh, the buns, looking at how you're going to build a sandwich. It's going to be exciting uh, yeah. to, to, to start going through food for, but you for know a what? restaurant it, you want to open. It's work. And, yes. you know, it's like tasting wine or developing uh, a wine list. I mean, wh when uh, back when we opened Can Can in 05, we tasted, I tasted 470 wines with Bob Talcott. Oh, my the God. wine director that Chris Ripp had hired away from Buckheads at the time. Uh, but Chris Ripp, Craig Love, myself, and Bob. We did notes on 470 wines, opened up with 200 on the list. And uh, Can Can was a great spot yeah. for yeah. first date. Yeah. Yeah. Probably still is. But yeah. um, I haven't been there in a while. But yeah. Anyway, but, you know, so it just depends what you're doing. But you, you better be looking at all of it. Mm -hmm. You know, you're not going into opening with a lot of questions like, how am I going to cook this? You know, who's on first? What are the ergonomics? And you want people turning. You don't want a lot of lateral movement. Uh, when you're when you're in high production, which today is two or three thousand dollars of sales in an hour, uh, you can't be making a lot of unnecessary moves. Mm -hmm. um, you know, generally to keep those ticket times manageable, but it goes back to the menu engineering. You know, what's on the menu? How long does it take? You know, you're making it generally from scratch and fresh, right? Yeah. So you got to know all those things. How do those restaurants survive with huge? Honkin' menus. Um, yeah, with like so many. It looks items. like it's like a novel. Yeah. Like yeah. I'm reading Lord like of the yeah, Rings like trilogy. Like <laughs> Cheesecake Factory, yeah. Yeah, yeah. it's yeah. wild. I love Cheesecake Factory. Food's great. Yeah. But yeah. Like the menu's like this thick. Yeah. yeah. You, you know, you, you don't know. I mean, uh, less is more. Uh, you know, we've got, we're you know, obviously driven as a burger concept, but there's 18 burgers. So you've got beef, you've got lamb, you've got organic chicken, you've got vegan and veggie, and uh, a crab cake. And mm. to, to be honest with you, if anything, we would probably take one or two or three off before mm. we would make make the menu bigger. Mm. You know, seldom will a good restaurateur or chef put something on the menu and bring in an ingredient that's only going to do one thing. That's correct. You know, uh, if okay. I'm bringing in a specific potato or a piece of chicken or what have you, I want to know where that's going to apply to several different areas of my menu. 100%. Uh, or in the, p the case of uh, the potato that Dan was citing earlier, that you know that's just such a great product that it's going to sell really, really well, and that's your one big moniker. That's your yeah. monolithic signature potato on the yeah. menu because 
it's gonna it's crave worthy it's gonna be sought after it's it's executed so beautifully and presented well making yeah. the ingredients stretch further yeah yeah absolutely we brought in uh <coughs> we brought in ahi tuna a few years ago same thing is how do you get three things out of it so you've got a black and blue blue cheese blackened ahi tuna sandwich you've got tuna bites black and tuna bites and then you've got tuna also as a protein you put on a salad so you got a salad you got an appetizer and you got a center of the plate so you're getting getting three menu items out right. of one Doing main the same thing right now with a crab cake yeah sandwich cool. salad and that wow. a quick note on innovation dan was spot on there's a lot going on in equipment uh to i don't want to say miniaturize but bring the footprint down because kitchens are getting smaller you know, the days of the, your restaurants, half of the size of the restaurant is the kitchen because there's so much going on back there. That's, those days are gone. You know, the magic footprint is like three or 4,000 square feet. Maybe a, a eighth or a fifth of that is kitchen space. Sure. You know, it's compressed, it's small, it's compact. So a small piece of equipment that turns out in a short period of time, a very highly um, browned and well-cooked product is really sought after. And if it's easy to clean or even self-cleaning, that much better. Yeah. But equipment companies, as well as food ingredient companies, are spending a lot of time engineering and doing the innovation on things that remove some of the labor that is the highest That's cost That's my next now. question. So, yeah. you know, yeah. uh, a, a croissant comes out now pre-proofed. So they what's, take- What's pre-proofed? Uh, so uh, a good French, French croissant has to be what they say fermented. Or, or proofed, made to rise, the yeast gets a chance to expand that product. Okay. So they're doing it in a way now where they have a way to thermally, temperature, thermally affect that dough product through a spiral proofing mechanism that it, it allows it to pre-rise and then it hits a, a nitrogen bath and freezes it solid, holding that rise in suspension. So now the operator is really just baking it off. It shortens the bake time. Mm. They saved hours of time and labor of handling it twice. Goes from freezer to oven. And I think it's a really brilliant technology that's helped people still <laughs> put out that really excellent quality product that would be a lot less time to, well, to I, execute. I, yeah, what you're describing there, right, is twofold. I mean, y y obviously the name of the game, right, is turning tables, right? And, you know, if you're, if you're sh like from an operationally, you're uh, making the footprint of the kitchen smaller, you now have more tables potentially, right? And then you're also saying, okay, let's, let's do this in a way that we can, you know, get it out quicker, right? Yeah. But still being fresh, right? Yes. But yeah. see, yes. I, here again, it raise a good point, the, the footprint. So let's just say you have 20 tables. Yeah. You know, we can't, in, in a casual dine, you're probably not taking reservations. Mm -hmm. Maybe you do, maybe you don't. But let's say you don't. Okay, Burger Batch doesn't take reservations unless it's six or more, or like a long taco or something like that. All right, so if you've got 20 tables, that means it could, not necessarily will happen, where 20 parties come in all at the same time. So if, if they all come in at the same time and you're inside your four walls and you've got 15 or 18 or 20 tables, guess what happens? People start placing orders. So the bar is now making drinks. The kitchen's starting to make some appetizers or, or make, you know, just menu items, dishes. So you can be careful what you wish for. You know, again, some people think, well, hey, I can go over here and get five or 6,000 square feet. I can get 250 seats. Bottom line is you don't want them. Yeah. You don't mm -hmm. want 250 seats. You don't want 50 or 60 tables. You don't want 60 people outside on your patio. Why? Because you can't serve them. And if you do serve them, and what should be an eight-minute ticket time is now 22 minutes or 24 minutes, you're not going to be doing this very long. Customer satisfaction will go down. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if, if we can't fill your drink, make your drink, you know, pull your beer, bring that dish to you, whatever it might be in a reasonable time frame, and you can't if you're too big. So there's a cadence to it yeah. where, again, you can't determine when's everybody coming. It's a dance that you're, you're it, always it, trying to. It is. Yeah. It is. Wow. You better know how to play it. Huh. <laughs> yeah. Good way to put it. Yeah. Hmm. So, Burger Batch, Cocky Rooster. Um, you have another well, chain. Well, I'm, I'm working with Chris Shway, who's the founder and the um, owner of EAT, E-A-T, EAT Partners here. Uh, great story with Chris. Mm. His dad was in the business, uh, owned all the area Pekings. I think there were four. So I believe his father's name is Dick Shway and Dick Dew. 
were the partners behind P. King. So Chris, again, not unlike Michael, Rip grew up in the business, very, very smart guy, went to Wall Street, working up there and doing the Wall Street shuffle. Interesting story about him. You should have him in. He actually was there and saw the towers. Mm. Oh, uh, my gosh. Oh well. Wow. Yeah. Uh, that didn't drive him back to Richmond, but he came back and said, hey, I'm going to get in, in the game and uh, bought an Osaka from one of his relatives that used to be out off Pouncy Track. And that was the beginning of eat. But um, <coughs> he's got 15 restaurant concepts, right? Uh, 13. 13. Right 13. Couple of doubles, though. So kind of that's where the numbers yeah. come. Yeah. There's a couple of PBRs, uh, pizza and beer, Richmond. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, a couple, that's a cool a, spot. There's yeah. a couple Wong tacos. Two Wongs. Now. Yeah. Two Wong. So anyway, uh, we got acquainted early on, and uh, he, he uh, sometimes calls me one of his mentors. But uh, that's the gray hair. <laughs> but uh, you know, we we we've, we've been acquainted, and I'm uh, right there with you. Yeah. So. Uh, I tell people we finally stopped flirting and decided <laughs> to, to, to collaborate a little bit. But uh, Wong Tacos, Wong's Tacos was, was something that he wanted to expand, and I've had a little bit of experience and success expanding. So, uh, you know, locked in on that. And uh, uh, Wong's Green Gate had been open now three years, and then we opened up uh, the Midlow location uh, this February. And, and the idea there is to scale it and grow it. I mean, we want to we do several. So when you scale and develop, then do you go to like on a capital raise to s score that, or are you just uh, personal assets? There uh, you go. Good, another good question. Um, in this particular instance, you know, you're 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 looking at do you want to have an investor or investors? Uh, generally, you know, partners will will invest. You know, I invest. Chris invests. Um, he's got some investors and other concepts, but. Uh, uh, we're in good position there in terms of, of of capital for growth. So I've I have a question on that then. So is it better to if you want to expand restaurants and have multiple them? Obviously, there's two ways. Obviously, raise capital and launch them yourselves, or do the franchise model. What are the pros and cons of doing both? For like, like Torchy's Tacos, great taco spot. He just got like 450 million dollars in investment to expand which is insane. So that's a lot of taco joints. Mm -hmm. um, is it more that if you do that route, you have more control? Is it harder that way versus the franchise route or the pros and cons of that? Uh, really, really good. Uh, you know, I went to Torchies when it first started in Dallas. Uh, they have great success. They compete as fast casual. Right. As opposed to casual dine, fast casual, order the counter, pay at the counter, maybe go get it or they bring it to you. Casual dine is more of a, of a service model. But, um, you know, franchising, when I moved here and started Bullets uh, before you guys were born, uh, <laughs> we opened up, I think, six of them before we started to franchise that. We franchised in gas and convenience. So our first franchisees were local gas jobbers, uh, John Seibert and Don Rennie. So if you hear this, uh, I miss you guys. But good guys, very successful in, in the gas industry. But uh, the things about franchising, you're, you take less risk with capital to franchise, and, and let's say you're getting a franchise fee just for marbles of 5%. Uh, conversely, if you go open that location in Virginia Beach and it does X amount of dollars, uh, the cash flow could be six figures over many times if it's successful, good concept, good location, et cetera. So you can get a little bit here on a royalty if you don't want to compete in the market. So it is a good way to get the brand out there. It's a good way to get into markets you're never going to go to. You know, we're not going to put a longs in Keokuk, although I've been there. Um, <laughs> but anyway, uh, it, it really depends what your strategy is, if it's just about growth. When the Outback guys started in Tampa, and, and I knew the two founders very well, still do, uh, they did their first seven stores, you know, in and around Tampa. And then they started to franchise. But because the brand had such explosive, enormous success, they ended up buying the franchises back, you know, into the parent company huh. for that reason. So uh, Outback is not longer a franchise anymore? I don't know that they do anymore. They hmm. did in the beginning, but then they bought them all back and operated them. And it's a, a unique, model. one of the more unique business models you'll ever see being all store or all company stores with the, the JVP, the Joint Venture Partnership model. So he's he or she is not a GM. They have to buy in to take the job as general manager, and they're called a JVP. So they're a joint venture partner. 
Mm. Different strategy, different different growth method. But they went from zero to a billion dollars faster than anybody because yeah, of just what just a billion. because of what <laughs> John just said. They huh. they shared. They shared it at the profit line. Wow, that's interesting. Okay, yeah. so so there is a degree of ownership that that person is taking in that individual location, right? You own you own a percentage of the cash flow or the profits. Wow. Okay. Yeah. You and then so it's, it's like a hybrid. So it's not it's not quite as like giving away as much uh, ownership as you would with the franchise model, yeah. right? Well, it's not like uh, voting or equity ownership. Uh huh. It's it's more of an ownership of, of okay profitability. Yeah. It, you know, to me that touches on something that is one of the greatest assets or greatest liabilities, depending on how you look at it, in the restaurant industry, which is human nature. You know, that gives you a skin in the game. They tend to treat their restaurants differently than, oh, I'm punching the clock. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So when someone's got skin in the game, look how they run their business. They're sharp, they're on it. I always say, I hear people saying now since 2020 <laughs> that They've never worked so hard in their life because we're missing staff and so on. I said, no, you worked this hard. You just forgot about it. It was your freshman year in this industry. You want to get back in the game? Work like a freshman. Pens in your pocket. You're on your game. Your sleeves are rolled up. You're watching your clock. You're moving fast. And that's what this industry needs of all of us now, right now. We've got to work hard. We are working hard. But there's a reward there. There's a reward of loyalty. If you do it right, like Dan's concepts do, there's loyalty, there's growth. And there's remarkable feelings about that humanity that's involved with this industry. The hospitality industry is all about people. Yeah. Yep. Wow. I feel like, though, in the hospitality, not the food side, but they've almost, not dehumanizing, that's not a word, but, like, you can check into a hotel now without interacting with a single person. And Let's see how that I, goes. I think that takes, yeah. like, you can literally check into a hotel, and now your phone is your key, and you can swipe your phone and it unlocks the door when it decides to work. Um, but I feel like that kind of takes away from the customer service component. And this well, was a and nice I hotel. I think you also got to consider the fact that uh, now we're going on a little bit of tangent. It's extremely like, tangent. Uh, it, it turns yeah. it into a commodity, a hundred percent commodity. So, yeah. so it's almost to the point where you're taking away. I mean, that's kind of what Airbnb is, right? Is that experience of like, I can check into an Airbnb with someone and I can just show up and the key is there and I walk in, I get that private experience. But, but the hotel always had the concierge. The hotel always had the, the personal touch, the people. But right? the I Airbnbs that won, though, yeah. are the ones that added the extra steps, like uh, having local things that you can get. A local guide, right? local guide. Yes. Oh, yeah. They I took just, it a step yeah. further. I just booked an Airbnb, uh, and it offered a photographer to come photograph our group. They offered... Uh, yeah. Uh, just like a whole bunch of stuff, they w they were like, uh, you could uh, you could do a, a ceremonial a tea ceremony meditation, a meditative tea ceremony. Anyway, they had they had like a whole bunch of stuff they were offering, and I was just like, all right, that's different. Yeah. Um, but you know, I think Smart. I think uh, the lower end hotels, I think that like a Motel Six, a, a uh, you know your your uh, I don't want to talk to their customers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Like they are what they are. They're commodities. Yeah. Like you're not. You're there because you have to be there. Yeah. Like you're there out of utility. Out it is of utility. a functional thing more I don't, than anything. That'll never, yeah. ever, and I know somebody very well, that'll never happen at a Waldorf Astoria. I guarantee it. No. Never no. happen. Yeah. And you've seen, God. you know, you've seen in, in our industry, too, where some concepts uh, through innovation, you come in and they, they seat you and they greet you and they hand everybody an iPad and off they go. And, you know, you figure it out. Now, somebody might come over and say, hey, that's an iPad. Okay, got that. Uh, in that iPad, here's the beverage section. You know, here's the appetizers. Here's this and that. But uh, so you punch in your stuff. It feels like the airport model. Well, here's the thing. Uh, it, it, it started to rise a little bit, and you don't really see too much of it anymore. So I, I hate I, it. Well, I, th I think I, you're not alone. I think the consumers have spoken and said, you know what, I'd rather, I, if I'm coming out, I'm going to spend time and, and an evening with somebody around food and beverage and, mm -hmm. and uh, those kind of things. I, I I want somebody to serve me. Sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah. How how are dads going to ask the name of the server, right? Yeah. If they if they don't <laughs> so have yeah. I, if they're I, talking to an iPad. Speaking of iPads, <laughs> this is a controversial. Yeah. Who am topic. I? Who, who am I going to say that I hated the dish even though it's gone? So <laughs> who am I? Who am I going to make <laughs> that who joke am I to? to? The new. I hated it. <laughs> the new thing. <laughs> it, this is a tipping thing mm -hmm. is not some more restaurants, but now I seem like even with like 
um, like even like uh, sandwich places, like uh, I mentioned, pot bellies. Um, you flip it over and you and this person who did not Nothing. jack squat yeah. turns the iPad around, like swings that thing around, and it's already selected on thirty percent tip, and I always hit no, <laughs> and I swing it right back at him. Uh, what's your thought on that tipping culture philosophy? I think it's kind of gotten a little out of control. I don't like it. Um, I, I say I don't like it. I don't. I don't like it when on that end of it, on the service side of it. Uh, they're looking to get an automatic gratuity for something that really wasn't, you know, that doesn't really call for it. Now, conversely, it's a little bit different. You know, if you if you call into a place and somebody takes your order and everybody screaming and yelling, they take it and they repeat it back and they get it right and you come in and they get your card and you know they do a lot of stuff and they go get it or bring it out to your car. That's service. Right. That's different than hey, I'll have a latte and flip the thing over, which of course you know Starbucks doesn't do, but but I, that. That bothers me too. However, you know I'm a hospitality guy, so I mean you're starting at 25 or 30 percent when I walk in. I mean you've got to do something bad. But I'm in the industry, yeah. So sure. I I know that's how we you know and, make yep. a living. And, and doesn't tip stand for to ensure proper service? Isn't that the? It's oh, an acronym, well. right? Yeah. So it's to. I didn't know that. Yeah, a tip is not like I'm giving you a tip like an idea. It's yeah. more of a yeah. to ensure proper service. Let me yeah. let me ask you about marketing. In your experience, what is the marketing that has worked best? Typically, there's two two mm -hmm. approaches. One is a, an awareness uh, you know, campaign about awareness, and mm -hmm. the other one would be a call to action. So I really yeah. Tell so me about I, the call to action. Okay, well, a, a call to action is if if I want you to try something, the best way to get you to try it, it's called free. It's free. Okay, yeah. free food. Yeah. <laughs> you might it. you might try it. It's free. Okay, so how do I get you to try a burger, a chicken wing, a taco, a margarita? Uh, so what's your call to action? However, you got to be careful too. I mean, if, if, if you discount or you, you cut into your core brand or identity, and that's why you don't see a lot of it. When you get into that above QSR, you know, fast food level, you don't see a lot of it because it, mm -hmm. it kind of demeans the brand a little bit. But uh, the call to action is just that, is... Uh, if you give today, you know, everybody wants to capture data. You know, if you give me your email mm -hmm. uh, and you go online and you post something on Instagram or that you've been here, you've been there, uh, you can use this QR code and come in and get something. Yeah, that, yeah. I've seen know. that. I've seen that with a lot of the cookie places. Yeah. Uh, like, uh, I think, it was it Red Eye? Not Red Eye Cookies, but it's like. Red Eye Cookie Company. It could be. It could be them. Uh, there's, uh, yeah, yeah, maybe that's it. Yeah, Red Eye. But uh, I've I've seen them where they where they say like uh, post this get a free cookie yeah. because that's yeah. that's pretty low stakes. But that's not as that that that's pretty low stakes. It works seems to work with a cookie. I don't see it working with the whole meal. Well, it doesn't because then you're a nonprofit. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. Yeah. Yeah. You're a charity. Yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. Then you've just yeah. created. Then you've turned yeah. the There's the world into a mar into a marketing agency for a free. There product. is to Dan's point. Uh, I think a very smart way to do this, and I'm going to cite um, a flatbread concept. Uh, I, I don't know if they're still in business. I haven't seen one in a long time. It doesn't matter. The behavior is what I want to call out. And so it's a flatbread sandwich concept, but they actually made a dessert. And so essentially this was, a, this was kind of a s'mores that you assemble yourself at your table. So they would have this platter. It had the little flaming thing in the middle. It's, it built like a poo-poo platter almost. Mm -hmm. And it had the chocolate, the marshmallows in this. They used the seasoned up flatbread that they were making in this uh, brick oven. And what they would do is about, I don't know, when they knew they were really busy, they'd be prepared to give one away, but you didn't know that. So they would send a server out searching for who ordered it. Think about that. They'd have to slow down at each table. Meanwhile, while you're slowing down, you're watching it go by like, what is that? <laughs> and so they're slowing down. Well, Everybody's getting a big look at it. And you know who they're looking for is a bunch of gals. And they're like, this is on the house. And the minute they set it down, they, ah, ah, <laughs> big ah, reaction, right? Yeah. Uh, five orders, the the average they got. Wow. Five That's orders, wild. Five orders would follow. So think about that. I yeah. mean, think about a new dessert. Think about it, something like, get up off your chair and think, folks. You know, if you're in the if you're restaurant and hospitality industry, versus yeah. just having the server ask. One of the dessert? largest organs in the human body, aside from your skin, is your brain. Use it. I mean, think. Don't just assume everyone understands your and business model or what you're doing. Show it to them. Show it off.
do it in a smart way, and it would repay you greatly. It's kind of like when clubs put like sparklers on the wine, and they're gone. Oh, on the to make, yeah, for bottle <laughs> service, right? Because oh, you, 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 you feel special. You wow. order the, uh, you, the thing of it is, you, is you want to teach them that when you pull that cork, you want it to pop. Yeah. Pop. Yeah. yeah. You want people to hear. Well, what was that? Yeah. Yeah. So why, it's a special why are we sound. not getting a Boop. bottle of wine, honey? You know. <laughs> pop. <laughs> I want to feel sizzling, special. The uh, sizzling, the sizzling of the uh, fajitas. Uh, fajitas. Yeah. yeah. Smoke. Yeah. So yeah. that that that's mm -hmm. called action. What what was the other kind? Awareness. Awareness. Brand so, awareness. So so yeah. now with that, are you talking? Uh, do you see that most effective through social media? Are you seeing? Uh, wh where are you seeing that being the, be the most effective? Like how are you how are you getting that awareness? What, where everybody is right now. I mean, Google is is leading the way on on everything in Google terms overlords of, yeah 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 Google's number one by far uh, you have to look at Facebook uh, it's not it's not as prevalent as Google uh, you got to look at Instagram in our industry you know a lot of people like to post uh, food I think some of the you know for me I just say it maybe I shouldn't but I've never liked Yelp because so many people are so over the top critical mm. it's it's fine to have an opinion it's fine to website be of Karen's yeah, but I mean, you you <laughs> got people weighing in on who your employees are, and and you know talking about things they shouldn't talk about. The yeah, best story is judgmental. the guy. Yeah, the, the best story is the the Italian pizzeria and an old school Italian guy in San Francisco that somebody complained about, and and it was a non valid complaint, and he went yeah. to Yelp and he com and he complained, yeah. said yeah. look, it it has to come off, it's not true, and they said no, we can't do that. So yeah. he said okay. Uh, so he put a sandwich board out front and said, the worst that your complaint is on Yelp for me, the higher your discount. He completely flipped the table on Yelp. So people are like, the most disgusting pizza I've ever had in my life. I got nauseous afterwards. <laughs> we'll be back tomorrow. <laughs> and Just he was giving out discounted the pizzas. To the, the, worst, the worst you could That's say about cool. me, the better. And, and Yelp is just like, Cricket, <laughs> cricket, and That's what do funny. we do? It's just sometimes you got to play the game. We're we're with you. We're we're not huge fans <laughs> of Yelp just for the simple fact that it feels very mafioso in well, their approach. There right? was the one thing they did uh, during 2020 is they set up donations on restaurant pages and didn't tell the owners of the restaurants, and people were donating. Yep. And unless you claimed the money, you didn't get it. It, it was held so in escrow. Were, and there was a whole lawsuit over it, and I'm I mean, not, I'm not know. surprised. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, it's it's one of those things. It's like, hey, if you don't pay us, we're gonna advertise your competitors on, on your, your page, page, right? It's just a it, it's very and, mafioso, and yeah, very much to your point, it's built on a culture of complaining about about something. And if you are building a review platform on the culture of negativity, right? Ugh, I, so I, the business owners are not gonna like it, obviously. We're we're getting close to the end here, okay. so uh, John, do you have something to say? Oh, just one last thing. Uh, we were talking about marketing, and I think Dan, uh, in his modesty, is not spilling the beans on one of the top marketing ploys. Ploys. It's not a ploy. It's a wonderful marketing maneuver that he has. Hiring a great agency like Fresh and Media. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Um, but and it's not obviously gonna work with every kind of restaurant concept, but it's paired beautifully with his and it's having one of the most powerful marketing tools a restaurant like cocky rooster can have is have a food truck mm. that goes around really? goes around and wins competitions like crazy yeah. so you're not oh, that's you're, brilliant you're, you're not yeah, locked down you're, to the location then yeah. yeah you're 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 going places where people are are already oh wow that's that's great it's a delicious billboard every time you go out <laughs> you, are, you are creating brand new people yeah. Like you're you're introducing yourself to a brand new market, that's <coughs> well, I'll smart. Give you a, I'll give you an example. At um, I attend the chapel, and uh, we had serve day Saturday, and so there's a campus out near Brandon Mill. There's one down in Scott's Edition. We took the rooster food truck down to feed the volunteers on Saturday. We fed 275 volunteers off that rooster food truck in about an hour. I can bring the mic a little bit closer. Yeah, after going out, <coughs> you know, into the community and just helping people, you know, yeah. painting, repairing, fixing, you know, doing errands and helping folks out. Super so, cool. Yeah, so, I mean, you know, those people probably never heard of it or seen it or anything else, which is a nice benefit, but it was all for a good cause to help reward the volunteers for volunteering their time. But, you know, to John's point, we started out the year. We got the truck a year ago, October. Our goal was to book 150 events uh we surpassed that and we ordered and received three weeks ago another 24 foot brand new 
2023 trailer, you know, all tricked out. So the trailer is now out there too, because it, there's such a high demand for the truck to go where you know people are in events and different things. That's cool. That's super cool. Yeah. That's smart. Any last tips going away? Would you recommend? Well, you know, I know we're out of time. I I wanted to come back and talk a little more on franchising, but maybe another time. Um, yeah, we could talk about yeah. restaurants a lot. And yeah. Definitely uh, love to have you back on. Talk. You know, we yeah. seem to do the mo- food the most out, out of everything that we do. We we seem to shoot as far as our photography and videography. Yeah. We seem to do like it's almost like seventy five percent food. Yeah. People are in, you know people are into it, and and Richmond is a tremendous tremendous market. You've seen it. I've seen it. We've seen it evolve, John last you know 20 and 30 years exactly. uh, i think that's all richmond's got is food it needs other things in my opinion, it was <laughs> it was named in the last few months as one of the top restaurant towns by food and wine magazine yeah. cool very yeah. cool very cool well you think about just in general how important food is to our lifestyle right yes. i mean uh, as americans that's like what we man i couldn't live without it <laughs> <laughs> literally teed you up for that one thanks <laughs> well thank you so much for being on today uh do you have one last thing you want to say no I, th- I felt like he was in the middle of saying something else so i wanted yeah. to make sure he th- no I, thought. you know again there's 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 other things that that go into it but uh really if you're getting into this industry you know really do your homework and and uh pay attention to what it takes to to get it going and keep it going and to thrive awesome, awesome. people cool. like john would if you can Grab John before you get rolling. You're in good shape. We work hard. Do you have any last statements, John? Yeah, just uh, I'm going to quote Dan on something uh, that's really important to our brand, to our company. Um, We were doing a a formal presentation for Dan and his business partners to understand what Integra really does for the restaurateur, to the big chain, the small chain, and everything in between. And uh, Dan was sitting across the room from me. I think I separated myself intentionally. Uh, because I think we would have been chatting. We've known each other a long time. But he kept looking across the room at me, kind of mouthing, and then later said it out loud, why isn't everybody doing this? Um, we're a big, powerful buyer at about $36 billion per year. And That's so a lot of food. that strength goes to our business partners in everything from food to uniforms to the parking lot to you name it. We really do a lot to help our partners as a silent partner we're very silent we're just making the deal in between the operator and the distributor we're calling those deals and it, and it touches back too on that supply chain they've done all that heavy lifting so you can piggyback on on the the, the buy side through partnering with Integra. and we've done it all those concepts don't we've reinvent done. the wheel yeah, yeah. <laughs> got it they've done that work so, so. Great. Uh, Again, thank you for coming on to the podcast, John. Thank you for uh, bringing Dan. Um, Next week's episode, actually, we're doing an informational video next week, but the next podcast is talking about government contracts. And we have a government contractor, a guy who owns a government contracting business, because that's an exciting topic. But (laughs) there's a lot of money to be made when doing business with the government. So it's your tax dollars at work there. So, uh, again, thank you for tuning in to the Think Fresh Move Forward podcast. See you next week.